You know, family, we've been suckered into another position. We got into another space where we've been misdirected. This political theater, which is what I've been calling it because that's literally all it's been as far as black people are concerned. We don't get any benefit or anything. You know, we might get a little runoff or something. Whatever happens for the social environment in general, sometimes we can get in there and, you know, take benefit from it. But in, in large, we don't get any um, space for the African people who laid the foundation for everybody to be eating good, living good, and carrying on well with this whole entire experience. It's on truly on the backs of Africans. And the loss that African people have incurred because of this uh, experience, because of all that we're so proud of, this experience, this, this, this theatrics here, and this lived experience has produced uh, nothing for black people. In fact, they continue to put black people at the position where, you know, who cares about black people? We can just dump on them. It's all right. You know, um, and I don't know how did blackness get in the forefront of this, which is a true, you know, three card Monty. It's really a misdirection. Um, this election is not about race. Um, it's about racism because for African people, for black people, racism is always looming in the air, just hanging over in some way under the guise of anti-blackness. So we acknowledge and we see that, but this election should not be standing, not with all that is happening in our social and global and uh, national landscape. How did we get in the front row of this? You know, you know the, the, the migrant crisis and all these things. Yeah, it has something to do with us, but it don't have nothing to do, to do with us. It doesn't. Because at the end of the day, um, they've done this already. You know how many migrants have come to America and built out this country and done the things that they've done? These people are not are not controlling the space on accord to what's in our best interests. What should be happening is we should be changing our behavior as a group. And that is not necessarily against anyone. It's just for us. The focus is off. And I think that the way the focus has been presented by so many different spaces, including a lot of black talking heads, is that um, there's a us versus them conversation that's happening, which is not going to be in the benefit of black people. Like, seriously, if we think critically about where black people are placed in this You got country, some obligation and responsibility to save the world. You got to save everybody first before you save yourself. Now, I'm a pilot. I don't fly anymore. I'm too old to be flying. But one of the first thing I would tell people on my plane as passengers the first thing you do, if we lose cabin pressure at, at, uh, at 30,000 feet, we, lose, we don't have any cabin pressure at night over 10,000 feet. If you lose cabin pressure, a panel over your head will fall down. Mm -hmm. Right. When that mass falls down, the first thing you all should be doing is putting the mass on yourself. Mm -hmm. Quit trying to save everybody. Why has always got black folk marching trying to save it? We're marching for gays. We're marching for women. We're marching for, for poor people. We're marching for the handicapped. And yet you only control one half of 1% of the wealth. You haven't got a snowball's chance. And in the, in the end of slavery, as I said, you had one half of 1%. Guess what? The average white person at that point in time had 3,500 times more wealth than the average black. That means that 99% of everything in this country was, was in the white society. And it's still in the white society. I don't care from, from Vermont all the way to California, San Diego. 98% of everything of value is locked in, in the white society. 87% of it's frozen, locked into white society. You can't get it out. So all you got to compete for is about 13% is up for grabs. Mm. And if black folk don't learn how to compete for that 13%, you are through. And right now, that's, that's what's happening around the world. You see all these, it's, we're going to implode in this country. The same thing happening now, happening in Germany with the Jews. And there was a book out called Hitler's Willing Execution to say the same thing. When certain kind of things began to happen to you as a group, you better be very careful. Because you got a group now that you all don't know about called uh, the Council of 300. What they want to do now is say, we got too many people on earth and we're going to start losing resources. Having it be a divisive conversation about us versus them is not, it's going to put too many people at risk. And I don't even understand why would anyone, why would anyone take that? By position? 1710, for instance, uh, Virginia then said now that we have a unified white community, they then broke up the black community by passing what they call meritorious manumission right. in 1710. And what that says now is to make sure that blacks never have a strong sense of community, a unified self, we will 
grant meritorious manumission. That's why all these southern states had meritorious manumission laws mm -hmm. to any black who goes against his own people. Mm -hmm. Which in effect said that blacks could be freed that's right. Uh, to enjoy rights and privileges in the society for becoming traitors to their own race. Right, as a free black. Mm -hmm. But it would never could be comparable to a white. Right. So when that, when that law was passed, then, then we found that, that, that a black could be rewarded for squealing another black, what we call crabbing. Mm -hmm. And out of a possible 150 so-called insurrections or revolts, mm -hmm. slave revolts, a black person squealed in every one of them. Okay, and he was rewarded for squealing on blacks. That's where you get the crabbing in the black society. Which is society. why there was virtually never a successful black That's revolt. That's right. And, but, but see, and, and that, kind of, that kind of a system was never used against any other group in this country. No other group, Chinese, Hispanics, or, or, or any other group. Oh, you what should be happening in our communities is people should be talking about first aid. People should be talking about mental health first aid. People should be talking about growing food. And people should be talking about stockpiling and saving and community organizing among groups and within within small. This is the these are the things that we should be talking about. You know, food. You know, um, and these things in case they you know cut off our supplies and different things like that. Because COVID, they did it for like five seconds and everybody went buck wild crazy. Five minutes. You know, and there are so many things that can happen in our communities that are already deprived that we're spending wasting time talking about all these things and no time talking about those things. And then the people that are in these spaces and places, what they're actually doing is they're waiting to be fed. We can't have people in our community waiting to be fed. People get agitated with me all the time because I stand for personal responsibility. I stand for what can you do for yourself? How can you contribute to the group? That's what I stand for. I don't stand for sitting here with your hand out. Absolutely not. Yeah, you can ask for help, but there is nothing wrong with you that you can't contribute. There's nothing wrong with you that you cannot support yourself. You can choose to opt out. I can't choose to opt out. I couldn't choose to opt out ever because I'm not built for that, whatever these folks got going on up and through these streets. I like taking hot showers. I'm just saying. Like, so I don't get the whole conversation. And from an African to another African, we're only as strong as our weakest link. You know, so I don't allow people to utilize all the, you know, the, the, the emotional triggers to try to get sympathy. Get your butt up. If you have a problem, fix it. If you're ill, get help. If you have something going on with you that you need address that you can't do within yourself, then you get, you get to get up, be in action, drive the car, go seek out and find support and keep doing it until you get support. Because you also have faculties within yourself that can contribute to the whole. And because you're wasting time being afraid, contributing to your betterment, to your own personal betterment, you can't contribute to the whole. So now what we have, if you're not an asset, you're a liability. And that's real talk. And I'm, I'm just so annoyed with the fact that our people in our community have, yeah, I'm not talking about tough love. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about setting our people up to win. I'm talking about you're capable. So let me give you some tools to help you be capable. You know what I've gotten consistently for the past 30 years? Push back, mad, angry, upset pushback. Like people really not here. Even the folks in the front of the room, what they're doing is they're contributing to keeping people small. They're contributing to feeding that needy and that, that uh, beggy and need sympathy and charity. They've been feeding that spirit because there's a space for them in that spirit in that space. They don't have the faculties to encourage and to, to create development for our people. Development people need jobs. Why do we, why is black people out here still screaming black folks need jobs? How is that the math for us doing what we need to do? There are enough of us that are working. If we had the right strategy, I have the right strategy. If we had the right strategy, I haven't been able to get into that at all because everywhere I go, there's gatekeepers barring, 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 barring. Bottom line, and there's no way I can be on social media on, uh, with, with a minute, two minutes, 10 minutes, and, and just be doing all, there's no way I can do this type of work in that framework. So they did that on purpose. They disrupted the social environment, our learning environment, because they know anything that is going to be done with impact is going to take more than six freaking seconds online. It's going to take more than some scrolling on TikTok. It's going to require some self-discipline, commitment, and consistency. The thing that most of us don't have. And that's the thing that we need to get where we need to go. Continued and sustained momentum. And how frustrating it is 
for you to be in America or the UK and be losing your culture as you stand there noticing that it happens, right? Now, with all of that being said, I want you to think about African Americans who are 80%, 80% Nigerian. Because the Africans that came from Nigeria, the Africans that came to America, right, were the latest Africans in the transatlantic slave trade. First, we hit Jamaica. Then we hit from Jamaica. They broke us in Jamaica, then brought us to, they brought us to, um, to the Americas on them plantations. Jamaicans and African Americans are the same bloodline. We get, we get, we was on the same ships. We got off the same ship together. We got back on the ship together. Some African Americans were taken from African slaves were taken from America to Jamaica and back and forth during the intercontinental American slave trade after the transatlantic slave trade stopped. Right? But I want you to think about this. So if you, your second generation, just the second generation, you guys already losing your culture, losing your language, losing traditions, losing all those things. I want you to think about how you think it was when the first Nigerians, and the reason why I'm saying Nigeria for argument's sake, the first West Africans from the region that we now call Nigeria, how do you think it was for them when they came over here, right? And unlike, and unlike you guys, they were slaves. So you guys are coming over here, right? You got, you come in with your culture. Nobody's trying to take it away. Being brought over here under duress as a slave from that same area, from the same tribes, from the same Yoruba, Igbo tribes of Nigeria, from the same thousand tribes that's in Nigeria that I cannot name. Imagine that. Huh? Imagine their first generation, the second generation. You think they was even thinking about maintaining their culture? They was trying to survive. So I want y'all to take that in consideration because you now see and feel that you guys lose your culture immediately when you come to America because you're now in America where you are susceptible to American culture because culture changes. Culture changes. That's one thing. Culture is a constant, is constantly changing. And when you come to America, you get inundated with American culture. So what do you think them first Nigerians that was brought over here in slave ships, them first Nigerians who were made to work on them plantations until they died, them first Nigerians who came over here and couldn't even speak their language because it was against the law. They was get beat, whipped, and killed. Them first Nigerians that came to America and, and dared to do anything resembling Nigerian culture would get beat, whipped, tarred, and feathered, and murdered, and castrated for even attempting to do that. And you guys, y'all can do it if you want. You just lose it because it's something that naturally happens. So I want you guys to remember that. When some of you were talking trash about African Americans, all right, and us losing our culture, not knowing our culture. We got an excuse. We got a legitimate excuse. Now, what is your excuse? And consistency into a particular behavior and action within our community. Because you know what we've really done? We've practiced bad behaviors. And it's hard to break bad behaviors. That's why I say don't practice bad behaviors. You know, and now unfortunately, because of our bad behaviors, because of our lack of worth, we are now set in a forefront. We are now even more, even more trickled down into divisiveness. We were already divided. Now we're divided down even more. We even had an opportunity to come together and unify. About um, uh, O'Shea, and I really like his show, and I'm constantly following the King Gonda show and the brands that they have. What happens to us? And that's a really big question now. You see what's happened in Chicago, you see what's happening in New York City, and now you start thinking about self-preservation. And that's something where I feel that Pan-Africanism doesn't really address in as much as I believe in Pan-Africanism as a concept and I do practice it. I do believe in Pan-Africanism with delineation. And that means that once it comes to a point where the group in your community has to suffer for another group of another community, that's where the delineation needs to start. And I think that we all know that, but we don't want to put that into perspective, and we should. Pan-Africanism erases all of that in theory, and basically, you know, hey, let's all kind of deny ourselves to work with each other. But that doesn't happen, all right? I'm living in Uganda right now. I can tell you that it doesn't happen. You don't get parity from people. That's the issue. If you're a group that significantly has more than another group, and you've been in a place longer than another group, and you try to give foreigners parity, what, what happens to you? You end up being replaced. 
this is what happens to Africans, right? Even in their country, they're very hospitable. They help a lot of people and they help a lot of people get on. And they end up being replaced on their own continent by the Lebanese, by the Chinese, by people like that. And at the end of the day, you know, they have less and others have more. And I feel like that's gonna be the same case going on here. And as much as I love Haiti and I, I understand what's happening to them, and I don't really feel like anything bad should happen to them because of what the United States has done to Haiti. But at a point where I see like that might affect the black community in America, or if it would, what choice would I really make in speaking out to a point? That's what I'm saying, right? Like now I feel like 50 years, 60 years of seeing this going on, in, in, in black America and seeing how we've been in shambles. And I've seen other groups doing very well that are from the African diaspora. And I know that if it was the other opposite way, that would not be the case. If it was us coming back here, that would not be the case, right? We wouldn't get parity. And many times when we come to Africa, we don't get any parity. I can tell you that right now, I've been here four or five or six years. And it just comes to a point where you have to draw a line, right? You have to draw a line. All right. Now it's unfortunate what's happened to Haiti and I get it and it's, and it's not fair to them, right? They should definitely be helped to rebuild and, and, and so their people can thrive and it's unfair. But if that comes at the cost of hurting African-Americans, another displaced group, I don't think I can say, well, you know what? Well, let's all come together and just be one because it's unrealistic to come together and just be one when you're two different people, two different groups, two different and communities. I'm really interested in that work, but I'm here to tell you that I'm coming from a person who have been on the receiving end of this thing. Like on the serious tip, I have experienced a lot of, a lot more bad things from others from the diaspora who have come into this country and received the benefits and who stand on the backs of African people and get the benefit as replacements. They've been replacing black folks for a long time. I was looking in my early 20s when I'm looking for a position and all the jobs have bilingual. What do you call that? That's replacement. That's replacement. That means that because they have allowed all these other kinds of people into the country, they now have no need for English speaking people. We need bilingual. That's a sense of now you're cut out of opportunity, but that happened 25 years ago, right? And now they have individuals who have come into the community and they have jobs and they've been in space and places where they prefer them over African people. So wherever there's some affirmative action or some, verse, some diversity quotas, you don't find black Americans in those spaces. You find Caribbean Africans, Caribbean Africans, and you find continental Africans in those spaces. And then a lot of times when they get in those spaces, they have the audacity to be looking down their nose at black Americans as if you're actually a, a party to what is happening to African-American people. African-American people, what's happening to them is not an isolated incident. The matrix has you thinking that what you are seeing in black American communities is happening right now just out of left field. No, those are a sum total of incidents and a comp compiling of constant attacks and crisis that have occurred, has brought us here. But you get to walk into the experience, Johnny come lately, and look at this experience and make judgment. You know, but I'm still standing for coming together as a unified group. You know why? Because I have the skills to bring us together to create a unified group. Because Marcus Garvey did it. Because Malcolm X did it. That's why. We can still come together as a unified group because we have one singular need as a collective group. Cultural things, the conversation is tribal. Your group has this culture, that group has this culture. Black Americans have a culture that's really just a, a kit and caboodle of, of, of trauma. They just tried to make it and pretty it up, make it something nice. You know, grandma said you can sugarcoat shit. They call it a culture, but you know, whatever. I'm not here for that. I'm here for making a true assessment of what's working and what's not working. And at the end of the day, we're stronger as a unit. Black Americans, if we do an assessment, because I'm doing an assessment on Black Americans, and we are extremely um, shallow, uh, we're lacking depth of field in terms of our ability to think forward. Individuals from other cultures, continental Africans and Caribbean Africans, they have a sense of con a concept of self-pride and self-efficacy that they believe they're going to get it done before they even start. 
When you see them out here sweeping trash, when you see them in there brushing toilets, when you see them as a security guard, when you see them, you know, making a two dollars driving taxi or delivery trucks, they they still in their mind's eye, I am going to be that dude. I am going to complete this thing and I am going to be a winner. That is a type of trajectory that we as black people, the only method we use for that is I'm gonna finish my school and I'm gonna get my graduate degree, I'm gonna get that. I'm gonna... We do that thing. But their their type of pride and their type of self-efficacy is different. It's different than what we have as black Americans because we're working within a limited scope. We only wanna get this high. Those folks are reaching this high. There is a type of entire internal something that goes on within them that's different from what goes on within black Americans because we are operating within limitation. You know, there are other groups. I want you to see this clip of Asian people. First woman, Grace Meng from Queens, New York. First happy Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. Every year in May is a time to celebrate the accomplishments and contributions of Asian Americans. But this year is different. It's different because the past year and a half has been one of pain and struggle marked by despicable and sickening acts of hate and violence against the Asian American community. Those of Asian descent have been blamed and scapegoated for the outbreak of COVID-19, and as a result, Asian Americans have been beaten, slashed, spat on, and even set on fire and killed. The Asian American community is exhausted from being forced to endure this rise in bigotry, and racist attacks. People often ask what Congress is doing about this, and we are here today to say that Congress is taking action. Asian Americans have been screaming out for help, and the House and Senate and President Biden have clearly heard our pleas. Over a year ago, I first introduced my COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act to combat xenophobia and violence, and I'm so thankful to see the measure moving forward in the House today following the nearly unanimous and overwhelmingly bipartisan support the bill received last month in the, in the Senate, thanks to Senator Hirono and Majority Leader Schumer. The COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act will strengthen our defenses to prevent, report, and combat anti-AAPI violence, and it will build on steps, as I mentioned, already taken by President Biden. Together, these actions will make a significant difference in how we address hate crimes in America, not only during this pandemic, but for years to come. We looked at the Asian clip, right? We looked at this clip of Asian people. They didn't come together. They said the Vietnamese was there, Filipinos was there, Koreans was there, Chinese was there, Japanese was there. They got an anti-Asian hate bill. They didn't get a Chinese hate bill, because that's what I'm hearing us say out here in the world. They didn't get a Chinese hate bill and left all the Japanese and all the Koreans. They didn't do that. They got a full everybody together for these efforts. And we didn't see not a single protest. I didn't see nobody screaming and hollering in the news. We didn't see any of those things. All we saw was them go up and have a press conference saying, yep, they getting ready to sign our bill. And we getting these accommodations and these things are going to be attached to this bill. This, this uh, financial number is going to be attached to it. That's what they did. So, so, so that's because that's the formula that actually works. Nobody, nobody does that formula that we're talking about doing. And, and if we're going to do it this way, then we need a method. We need a system of information on where and how to apply it. Because you know our people don't think critically. We lazy brained. I was getting to that list of, of my assessment of what's happening with the landscape, on the social landscape of black Americans. We are followers. We engaged in the mob mentality because when we rally around something, it's not for good things. We rally around foolishness and we rally around drama and poverty porn. We like that trauma porn. We rally around those things. So to me, that looks like mob mentality. It doesn't have the energy of something positive, which is not good. And it doesn't take but a little teeny switch to turn it on. That's bad. That is very bad. Just so you know. Very bad. And you need people in our community thinking. We need people in our community with integrity, which I'm not seeing because I am the person that I am. And I'm telling you behind all the shades and all the things when nobody is looking, they're doing me dirty. 
They're not choosing integrity. They're not choosing to be honest. They're not choosing to be transparent. They're choosing to be deceptive and to be sneaky and to be in self-interest. This is what people choose. And I'm the person who has said, the reason why I'm the gauge in this particular method is because I set a pristine space. I set a full, a space of full warm, full African function and energy in this space. And yet this is what you choose to create in that space. So other people who don't even have the faculties that I have, I know how you do them. Cause if you're willing to do me like this, I know how you do the rest of them folks. I'm just saying it's a gauge. It's a, it's a meter, you know, and it's a meter that I get to use to do a social, a social assessment, a sociology, sociological assessment on it to find out, well, where can we, how can we make accommodations to get through this? This makes my life that much more challenging to get through this work, to do the work, to be in a, to be an application of the work in real life. Because these folks want to make sure they keep trying to cloak me. They keep trying to hide me. They keep trying to siphon off and take a little something for themselves because they want to self glorify. They're not looking at what the longer term is. And in other communities, when individuals have certain faculties, they hurry up and push them up front and get them set up and, and have that be an example for the community because they understand social learning. They also understand the collective self-concept. The collective self-concept. The African-American, the continental African, the diasporic African cultural concept is that we know that we don't, we don't get along well. We have an issue communicating. We have difficulty with too many of us coming together because it's going to be a problem. They come together as a group. Within five minutes, they break it up. Somebody going off solo. They come together as a business. Five minutes later, somebody partners stealing from somebody, taking, siphoning off money, doing something underhanded. Oh, they come together. Five minutes later, somebody got ego. I'm, I'm getting more. You get more shine than me. I need more shine. See, these are the things that happen. It's a little immature when they say we childlike. I'm just saying, I'm approving our lack of maturity in these areas. And I'm not talking about your street corner guy, which not to throw him any shade, because a lot of times I get farther with the street corner guy who has a little bit more integrity than the one in the office. I'm just saying. But I'm talking about individuals who are supposed to be in our society, some of our best and brightest. This is why I knock down the talent to 10th. There's no need for it. We need functional tools, tools and talent. So there's no need for no talented 10th because unfortunately our talented 10th has a limited scope. And as long as they have a limited scope, so does everybody else. And since they're not making an assessment on their own functional deficits, because I didn't ask to be in leadership. People just follow me. People just copy me. People just want to siphon from me. I didn't create, I didn't try to be a leader. I never did. I'm a teacher. I've been teaching since six years old. Six years old was my designation to be teaching, to be imparting and growing and bringing people out of ignorance. I didn't ask to be in leadership. I happened to be in leadership and other people who are in leadership recognize me as a force. That's what I've been called. Not just a leader, a force. Why? Because I've done so much work. I've paid so many dues. You have no idea. You have no idea how many times I've stood there in the face of all kind of stuff. Friend, family, folk, community, partnership, relationship, it doesn't matter. Professional spaces. When you when any kind of muscle, you have to you have to work on it. It has to work to become strong. And I'm here to tell you that the energy didn't show up like this just because I said so. And there is no costume here. And that's what really upsets people. I'm not wearing a costume. And I never did. I lived my experience. People who are on my timelines on Facebook and all these other places in my life, they've been in my life since I was a mid little, a small, young, preteen teenager. Some of them classmates. I went through my lived experiences out loud. I never drug myself through the ground and became a, a, a muddy person or, or slothful or sloppy person because that's never been a part of my being. But I did live my life in practice and it was observable growth processes by many people. So there's no costume here. But the thing about people is they want to skip the dots in between. Do the work. Do the work and live your life in apprenticeship because that's where you literally are for your development. I don't care how many clapping of bells and whistles and ribbons you get from the matrix. They keep telling me that I need to show up as, 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 um, 
in order to stop this behavior, I need to show up as, as high, uh, slightly elevated. I need to demonstrate the people that I'm above them. Nope. What really pisses them off is me and you the same. I want you to know me and you the same because I want you to make some choices. Because that's what's best for the African. I could take the weight off and get rid of the shave off some of the stuff by presenting myself as slightly elevated. Because what the psychosis of that does is it makes other people think that they can reach, but it gives them an excuse why they can't really achieve. So when they fail, they was like, oh, well, she's better than us anyway. Well, she's the Beyonce or she's Oprah or she, no. Nope. So when they fail, they don't have to feel bad about failing. I'm telling you, we are the same. So you get to make decisions. So if you fail, it's because that's those, those are the decisions that you made. Make better decisions. Yeah, because we need to strength. We're only as strong as our weakest link. And somehow them people have set us up where we in the front of the room. Now as the focal point of this theatric, this political theatrics. And we shouldn't be. We should not be. And it doesn't matter about the migrants. Because African people, Dr. Claude Anderson already told you that you are no longer the minority majority. The ma minority, majority, minority. Dr. Claude Anderson already said it. You are no longer the majority minority. And you knew that before the migrants got here. You knew that. This is not news to you. This is not news to us. We haven't been getting served. Our community, so when, when, if, if it hit the fan, it's usually black on black crime. Yo, we as a community need to be addressing that. We need to be fortifying ourselves in our community so that the haves don't eat the have not. The have nots don't eat the haves. That's what we should be working on. Because that's what happens. This, this stuff is not happening in our communities and we don't know it. We have failed as a group to put in moral fabric in our community and hold a standard of behavior. So now is everybody getting how you live? And that can't work for civilized society. This is why other societies don't want to live among us. I'm going to go into a conversation with us about continental Africans. And we're going to talk about this diasporic war. I'm going to have to give you some more feedback around that because this is, I'm going to have to cut this one short. The, the, the conversation is not a straight line. And I'm talking in terms of personal development, community development, self-awareness, self-assessment. I'm talking in terms of all of these different things. I'm talking at it from a personal perspective. I'm talking about it from a community perspective and I'm jumping back and forth. And I'm really hoping that you guys are following along because I know it's a lot and I know it dips back and forth, but I'm hoping that I'm discuss I'm, I'm having this conversation and it's with individuals who at least are processing on a level. Cause if you're not, it's okay. We, we, it goes from gamut to gamut. You got to check it with some more of my videos, but when I'm talking, it's in real time. It's in real time. And, and, it's, and, it's, and it's giving me like, my heart is like, wow, what is happening to us? How, are we, how is this happening? Like it shouldn't be, but it's happening because we are not paying attention. So fam, I'm going to come back. I appreciate you for coming in with me. Peace, power, and blessings. Thank you for coming into the Keys. So powerhouse, thank you for receiving from me. It matters. Sao Bona and Namaste the Divine me, honors and respects the Divine and you African. We are stand here for the ascending of the African soul and the opening of the African spirit. Peace and blessings.